Welcome back everyone. In today's video lecture, we're going to look in a little bit more detail at this concept of emergence that we've talked about briefly uh, here and there over the last few weeks. And then we're going to develop another processing example, this time using image files rather than just raw drawing operations. So I want to start by giving uh, a definition of emergence. It's not the only definition we, we could give, um, but I think it's one that helps us get into the get into the topic. Emergence we can think of as when systems demonstrate recognizable and meaningful behaviors that are not explicit in their rules. Um, sometimes people also talk about this as when the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And this principle of emergence or this phenomenon of emergence is something that is often talked about in the context of interactive and generative art. Because when we make interactive and generative art, like we all are for our fourth projects in this course, we are working as people who, who set up rules. Um, and if what we get out of those rules is very predictably what the rules say, and that's it, maybe that's not so interesting. And conversely, when we set up the rules, but somehow the system um, does these other things that we didn't expect on the basis of the rules, perhaps that is interesting. Um, I think that there are people who would argue that emergence is something that happens in, in all kinds of complicated systems in our world. And in that sense, generative art, generative and interactive art, like we're exploring at this point in the course, part of the significance of it is that it becomes a way of exploring this very general idea of emergence in, in a very small, safe, constrained way. Um, so with that um, said, what I want to turn to now is a very famous example of a, of a game or simulation or model that is often cited when people talk about emergence. It's a, it's a, a model called the Game of Life um, that was created by the mathematician Conway in 1970. And um, the game is played out on, on a grid of cells. Like if you think almost of a tic-tac-toe board, um, here's my representation of a tic-tac-toe board. Um, except that usually on the game of life, it's like a very, very large tic-tac-toe board, many, many rows and many, many columns. But to talk about the rules, we can work with just the tic-tac-toe board. I'm going to put some comment signs here so processing stops com complaining about my uh, text here that isn't processing code. So for the sake of understanding the rules, let's say that X represents um, a living cell and O represents a, a dead cell. So a living cell or space and a dead cell or space. And the way the rules work, they're always from the perspective of some, um, for some central cell. So let's say that this cell is the cell we're wondering about. Um, and the way the rules work is that you look at all of the neighbors of the cell and you count how many of them are living or dead. And depending on how many are living or dead, different things happen. So the, now we can go to the, to the three rules. So rule number one is that any live cell with two or three neighbors survives. And rule number two is that any dead cell with three live neighbors becomes a live cell. In any other situation, the cell either dies or stays dead. So let's pretend that our cell here in the middle that we care about is is living. So it's a living cell. And now what we do is we count 
how many cells around it are living directly adjacent, and that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are a lot of living cells around this one. Now, according to these rules, the live cell continues to be alive only if it has two or three neighbors. So this cell is going to change to dead in the next round of the game. And the way the game of life works is that you do those calculations for every cell on the board every turn, and then you get to look again at what it looks like. So it sounds simple, right? Um, these rules, you know, there's not much to them. Um, but this produces so much interesting variety that there is almost a cult around this game. Uh, and, and there are people who have um, invested large amounts of time studying the kinds of patterns that emerge from this game. Uh, and um, because we live in the age of miracle and wonder, there are lots of um, simulations on the internet where you can explore how the game of life works um, without having to program it from scratch, which is great. So I like this simulator here, and the reason why I like this simulator of the game of life is that it lets us draw um, by clicking and dragging. I can make a bunch of cells alive. So right now the, the, the model isn't running, and I am adding a bunch of cells to it. Some kind of random pattern. And now, having done that, what I can do is click Evolve, and it's running those calculations, those rules that we talked about, and we're seeing um, a whole pattern of things living and dying. And we're getting effects of motion as, um, as cells live and die in a way that makes it look like an object is moving across the screen. We're getting effects of oscillation, where we have patterns like over here, where the same pattern seems to repeat itself, following the rules. And we also have things that don't seem to move at all, because according to the rules, when you get those conditions, they end up being stable. So, you know, this is a great um, model for thinking about emergence here, because these three things, things that move across the screen, there's none of those right now, things that oscillate like this, and things that say stay still, those three possibilities are not anywhere in the rules of the game, and yet they happen. So let's, I'm gonna, I want to come back to that, the more general significance of that again in a second, but for, um, before doing that, I want to play a little bit with this model in front of us. Um, what's, what I really like about this particular website that lets you play with the game of life is that you can continue to draw on it so here I've got these four that are staying alive in a stable setting, um, I guess because if you think about it, when you have this set of four here, they each one always has three neighbors, so it meets the rules. But if I add another neighbor here, one of them's going to die. Oh, and they all disappear. But what about over this one, if I add a thing in the middle? Whoa, it kind of blows up a little bit, and then it takes on a new stable formation. You kind of make these things move around. Sometimes you get surprising new results. What happens if I systematically inject life up and down over here on the side of the screen? I find myself wondering if there's a certain pattern I could put in here that will kind of keep things growing exponentially. Um, I do notice that right now it seems to be moving for much longer than it did in the first time that we started it a few minutes ago. So again, that behavior is not in the rules. It's, it's in the interaction between the rules and the specific conditions of the board that these results are emerging. So that's the game of life. Um, there's more that you can read about it online. It's been studied for for 50, 50 years now. Um, and moving back to thinking ab about the general significance of this, I think that we have seen um, examples of this 
and I've tried to call your attention to it in some of our early explan early explorations of generative art in processing or in punctual. Um, but we can think about other situations in um, contemporary media life where emergence is visible. Um, for example, game theorists and people who study video games are often interested in emergence because with video games, you have systems that are interactive and generative where there are clear rules, uh, clear and very strictly enforced rules about what happens in the game. Uh, and then the players arrive and they interact with the games and they interact with the rules and you get all kinds of things that happen there that are not directly assignable to the rules. Um, for example, um, let's say um, players in a competitive first-person shooter video game might have this behavior of, of griefing, right? Where they, their character dies and, and a character dies and respawns and the other characters know where they're going to respawn and they kill them again. Um, this behavior, this, this phenomena, this particular phenomena of griefing isn't mentioned usually in the rules. The system doesn't, doesn't require that to emerge, and yet it does when you combine the rules with the players um, and when, basically when the, when the system runs. And so it's, that's just one example. It's really easy to find all kinds of examples um, of how emergence plays out in uh, generative and interactive media systems. So, so when, we, when we're analyzing these systems, whether they are our own or their systems created by others, um, emergence is an interesting phenomenon to be attentive to, and 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 thinking about emergence gives us language, a uh, very general language for perhaps describing some of these things that happen. So there you go, a little bit more about emergence. So moving on to a different topic, um, I want to show you. Uh, and explore a little bit working with pre-made images in processing. And the reason why I want to work with pre-made images in processing at this point, when you still have about a week and a half or so um, left before this project is due, is that I think that working with photographic images in processing, among other things, is one way of um, bringing um, media capture like cameras, etc., into your projects. So it's also then one way of making projects more distinctive and or original because you're gonna be working with media material that no one else is, is working with. And perhaps also a way of making projects more um, representative or um, uh, more concrete or realistic um, because of the potential for using photographic imagery. So I don't think that all of our projects have to use this, but I think that for, for, for many of us working with processing projects for project number four, it's going to be um, a way of bringing some extra, um, just bringing, bringing more to our projects. Um, for example, we'll also have the possibility of um, using our existing skills, for example, with the GNU image manipulation program uh, to manipulate images and then use those manipulated images in our processing projects. So our projects for this fourth project, of course, um, are typically gonna have some code in them, but that doesn't mean they have to be only code. Um, our creativity in these projects can also take the form of manipulating the resources that our code uses such as images. And I just, I'm gonna to focus today on using photographic images in processing, but I just wanted to mention um, also that if you are doing a live coding sound project using Tidal, and you follow the instructions here on tidalcycles.org to install Tidal on your own computer, there's a page here, Custom Samples, where uh, they give you some instructions for using your own sound samples in your Tidal performance. And I think that's really the equivalent idea to what we're gonna talk about here today with working with photographic imagery. I'm no, not gonna demonstrate that, but I'm happy to help people privately who choose to go down that road. So, let's make a processing sketch. And like every time that I do this, I'm gonna start 
by making my basic template of a processing sketch that does nothing, just so I get that endorphin boost of making it go, and yes, it's working. And I'm gonna make a bigger canvas and then test that. Even though I've done this a thousand times, I test it every time I do it. Um, well, let's go a little bit bigger today. What about 800 by 600? Perfect. Okay, so to work with a photographic image in processing, I have to make a variable that contains or represents the image data. So in yesterday's lecture, we started working with variables and we made variables that were floats that represented numbers that could be decimal numbers. For example, we did something like this. And we saw that when we do that, now X is a container um, somewhere in the computer that holds a number which can be a decimal number and we can change the number that's there and we can also read the number that's there um, for example to model things so we're going to use that same idea for our image except that instead of the, the type of the variable being a float it's going to be the type p image and i'm going to call it i for image and we're not going to give it an initial value so i will be a place in the computer where we will have the data of our image. Now the next thing that I need to do is to load that image data. And it probably makes the most sense to do this in the setup. You'll remember that everything between the curly braces in the setup happens just once when the program starts, and that everything between the curly braces after draw here happens repeatedly. So since our image files that we're loading are not going to be changing, it doesn't make sense to to load them every frame. Uh, just makes sense to load them at the beginning. And the way we load them is with the load image function. And it works like this. We say i equals load image. And then we provide the name of an image file. Now there's an important caveat here, which is that the image file has to be in the data directory. So I've already saved this processing sketch and it's in this folder here called sketch 200325a. And this file is my processing sketch. That's my actual, the actual text of my source code. And then I've made a folder inside the sketch folder called data. And inside the data folder, I've put two files for today's lecture, one called brick.jpg and the other called prof0.ping. So if my image files are not there, I won't be able to load them and it won't work. So that's a likely source of problems. So having put the image there, I can now draw it using the image function. So every frame, I'm gonna draw this image and the I will um, draw the image I and I'll put the left and top corner of the image at zero by zero, which is the left and top corner of the canvas as well. And when we do that, what we're gonna get is this. So that's what we're getting. And I want to compare it to the original file for you. Here's the original file. So this is what the original photographic image of the brick looks like. And this is what we're getting. So you can see that um, we're really z very much zoomed in on the the top corner of the image here. We're zoomed in on um, well, how much is it? It's like I guess it's kind of uh, it's like this much here, this top square of the image is what we're zoomed in on. So probably not exactly what we want, but that's because we um, didn't do everything that we could here with the image. If we provide five arguments instead of three, the fourth and fifth arguments will be how wide and high the image is supposed to be. So they'll squash or stretch the image to fill that space. So I'm going to make the image 800 by 600. And then now my brick image fills the screen. Uh, and in this case, my image looks really naturalistic. And the reason for that is my canvas, which is 800 by 600 pixels wide, 800 by 800 over 600 pixels 
is a four over three aspect ratio if they're square pixels. And my image file, which was taken on a DL DSLR camera, is also, also has a four over three aspect ratio, I think. Uh, maybe it has six over four. Maybe it's, it's um, close. Um, in any case, thinking about aspect ratios and stuff like that is something that we might find ourselves doing as we start to work with photographic images in processing. So uh, I want to continue in the spirit of bricolage programming from this point. So I've displayed the image, woohoo. Um, but now I want to make a piece around this image. So when I look at this, and one idea I have is that what if this brick could be kind of like a ground on top of which a simulation happens. So what if I, what I want to do is I want to draw the brick as it appears here, but only down here and leave the rest of it up here um, to, be, to be blank. So I'm gonna to have to make a few changes, I think, for that. Um, first of all, I'm going to set a color mode so I can use HSV, um, in other words, HSV colors for the rest of my session here today. And every time we draw the frame, I want to, um, First of all, draw that brick, and then I'm gonna change the color to black and draw a rectangle over the upper part of the screen. So from zero to zero, 800 wide, but only 500 down, I'm gonna draw a rectangle. And I'm gonna, that's enough to test. So we're drawing the full the image of the brick over the whole canvas, but then we're effectively erasing a little bit of it by drawing a black rectangle over the top of that. And sure enough, it's working. And my idea is that we can use this as kind of like a floor and we can have objects um, moving around in the space above here in a, a kind of a simulation like idea. So I want to use another image for my objects, I think. Uh, but before I do that, I want to clean up my code here a little bit. My variable that contains my brick image is called i, um, because when I first started doing this, I was thinking, well, i for image, right? Um, but now that variable really has taken on a more concrete meaning. It's the image data of the brick. So I'm gonna change its name to brick image, and then everywhere I have i here, I'm gonna change i to brick image. And that's not gonna change anything about how it works. I'm just gonna prove that it still works the same. There you go. Um, but by making that change, by making my names of my variables a little bit more explicit about what the thing is being used for, I'm definitely gonna save myself from being confused and making mistakes later on. So um, the, the image that I'm gonna work with next is this image here um, that um, some students made of me in a final project um, quite a few years ago, but which I've been using as my avatar or icon ever since. And one of the reasons I wanna use this image for our demo now uh, is that it's, a tr it's actually a transparent ping. So there's, there's color data, but it, the image also has an alpha layer um, uh, indicated by this gray here. That's not an actual gray, that's actually just a transparent area of the image. Um, so that could be really useful, um, right? If we can use um, the GNU image manipulation program to make images that have transparency in them, and then we can work with those images in processing, and that transparency is gonna be preserved. Um, and you know, we might have some more interesting visual interactions that um, result uh, from that. So that's the image we're gonna work with. So I'm gonna call my variable to contain this image data um, prof zero image. And then I'm gonna load it just like I did with the other one, making sure the capitalization is exactly like it is in the file. And now I can display this image somewhere. So I'm gonna display the prof zero image after having erased most of the brick image. And I guess I'll display it um, halfway across the screen um, and at the very top of the screen. And uh, in terms of how, w with how high and wide to make the object, 
Well, I'm just going to put in these numbers, 100 by 100 for now, um, just to prove that it works. But then we're going to have to think about that a little bit more. So here I go. Now, sure enough, there I am. Uh, there my avatar is. But if we look closely at it, we can see that the um, proportions have been squished a little bit. So I think what we need to do is go back to our original image here. And on Mac OS, I'm going to use get info. Uh, I could also load it with the GNU image manipulation program and go through the menus there. What I'm trying to do is to find the size of the image. And so in the Macintosh info here, it tells me that this image is 365 by 424 pixels. And if I use my calculator, and divide 365 by 424, that's about 0.86. So my aspect ratio is about 0.86. In other words, this is an image that is narrower, uh, is a narrow image. It's, it's, it's narrower than it is high. So I'm just gonna make a note that my aspect ratio here, uh, I'm gonna, actually I'm gonna make the note up here next to the variable itself. Aspect ratio is approximately 0 0.806. So if I want this to be 100 pixels wide, um, it would have to be somewhat higher. If I want it to be 100 pixels high, it would have to be 80 pixels wide. That's what I learned from looking up the aspect ratio. If I run this now, now it looks like the original did. You know what? I'm not sure about that. I'm going to look at those numbers again. It really looks... Um, wider than it is high to me. I'm not sure if that's my eyes playing, playing tricks on me. I'm going to actually load it with the GNU image manipulation program. We'll just wait for this a second. Oh yeah, I see what's happening. It's 365 by 424, but when we load it with the operating systems preview, it's um, it's at, for some reason it's adding some extra space uh, on the sides. But the image itself is 365 by 424. So um, our numbers are good, um, but I'm glad we checked that. Now what I want to do is to start to use this image in modeling. And so in ways, um, in a way what we're going to do now here is really just a review of what we did yesterday. But now we're using concrete imagery instead of using low-level drawing operations. So if I'm going to have a simulation, I'm going to need some variables that keep track of what's going on in the model, in the world that I'm simulating. And let's just say that, um, let's start from the idea of me um, bouncing around because I think that's something that um, we did yesterday and it's something that we could could lead to interesting results in a variety of different pieces. So I'm going to um, make a variable for the X position of our character and a variable for the Y position of our character and I'm going to make a variable for the X speed of our character and a variable for the Y speed of our character and uh, is that good? I think I'm going to make a, no, that's good. That's good like it is there. So we've got some variables. Now we also need to set these variables to initial values. So let's say that the character starts right where um, we started it right now, which was at 400 by zero. So there's 400 by zero. And let's say that the X speed starts at um, one pixel, so it's moving to the right, one pixel per frame. And let's say that the Y speed starts at zero. 
And the reason why I'm starting the y speed at zero is because I have this idea that we could um, simulate gravity here. So we imagine that the character is, is stopped at the top. They're just about to start falling again. And so our setup is good. We'll leave that as is. I'm going to leave a space here between things. And then if you'll remember, one of the things that I emphasized in yesterday's lecture is that it's often useful to separate the rules that change our variables from the rules that do the drawing. So here is our drawing. And here, above it, before it, we're going to have rules that change the variables. And so in this part, after this comment here, we're not going to do any drawing. We're going to leave all the drawing to the end. This model helps us keep things straight and um, think more clearly about what we're doing. So let's say that, um, first of all, that um, the x position of the character changes according to the x speed each time. And the y position of the character also changes according to the y speed each time. And if we run it with just this, we're going to see our character motor off to the right. Oh, no, we're not, because we didn't actually use our variables in the drawing yet. So here where I draw the brick, that doesn't move. Here where I erase the brick, that doesn't move. But here where I draw the character, instead of drawing at 400, I'm going to draw it at x. And instead of drawing it at 0, I'm going to draw it at y. So now when we do this, our character should run off to the right. Well, I'm not exactly running off to the right. Sidling off to the right. And we haven't set any rules that make the speed, um, x speed and y speed change. So it's just going to move that way forever. And we're not going to see it again. So let's add some, we'll, we'll, we'll address the bouncing issue in a second. Let's add some rules. Um, kind of like gravity. So let's make the y speed, the new y speed, be the old old y speed plus um, plus one. So every frame, the y speed is going to get a little bit faster. And when I run that, boom, we get a gravity-like effect. Except there's nothing to make the character bounce, so it just falls forever, and we don't see it. Um, ever again. So I'm going to have to add some kind of thing to catch when it bounces. So what happens when it goes off the bottom of the screen? Now here I have to think a little bit. I'm going to I'm going to launch the script again. Um, we we will probably want it to bounce at around you know when the feet of the character touch the brick here. So let's think about the geometry a little bit. Our canvas is 600 pixels high, and 0 by 0 in processing is up here. So this is the y position 600. This is the position 500. And our character is actually 100 pixels high. So when the character's toes touch the brick, the character's head will actually be at 400. So it's when the character reaches a y position of 400 that we want to bounce. So let's make a rule that does something when y is greater than or equal to 400. And I'm going to put curly braces. And everything inside the curly braces are the changes we think should happen when the character bounces off that 400 pixel wall at the bottom of the screen. So I think that there are the main thing that happens, really, is that y speed is changed to um, to its opposite. So if y speed was 40 pixels per frame, it would become minus 40 pixels per frame. We can do that by multiplying the old y speed, old y speed by minus one to get a new y speed. So let's see what happens when we do that. Hey, our bounce worked. It's actually pretty convincing. Right? It's got like a, a pseudo-physical effect because the rules that we've made are, are kind of like the rules of gravity. 
in physics. Um, we're not accounting for wind resistance or any of those other things that happen in our everyday world, um, but we're kind of we're kind of doing things the way gravity works. Um, so it's interesting, isn't it? How um, how quickly we can put together a few rules and a few variables and start to have something that models um, the real world, and in that way lets us explore the real world in various ways. Um, well, it would be nice if we were able to bounce off the right side of the screen as well, so I'm going to make a rule for that. If x is greater than or equal to 800, what do we want to do? We could do the same thing. We could say x speed equals x speed times minus 1. And we should also catch when they bounce off the left edge of the screen. So we'll do that with a similar rule. And we'll test it. Our system has a, um, a slight tendency to speed up in it. If you watch the character bouncing, we can tell um, by how long we have to wait for them that they're actually bouncing a little bit higher each time. And that's, that's an emergent effect of the rules that we've set up. Perhaps we should add a little bit of wind resistance. Um, to our model. Now, if you think about it, wind resistance, what it does is whichever direction you're moving in, it makes you move in that direction a little bit slower. Um, and so a simple, an oversimplified way of simulating this might be to say that every frame, our x speed and our y speed are multiplied by a number that's just a bit less than 1 to make them a little bit smaller like 0.99, and we'll do it to both of them. How about 0.999? And let's try that and see what happens. And so again, I'm bricolage programming here. I'm not, I'm not designing a complicated system. I started from a simple system that all it did was draw a brick on the screen. And then I added something and then I tweaked it, and I added something, and I'm, I'm going back and forth with little tweaks and additions responding to what I see the material doing. Where our, X, our initial X speed is so low, uh, it looks like to me like we've solved the problem, if it is a problem, of the character bouncing too high. Or maybe we haven't. Maybe we just slowed it down. Yeah, I think it's still getting a little bit higher each time. So maybe we could compensate for that by changing the speed. Uh, sorry, changing the wind resistance. We make the wind resistance a little bit stronger. So instead of it being 0.99, maybe it is 0.99. And I can't resist. I want to make the initial X speed a little bit higher too. And maybe I want the initial Y position to be a little bit lower so we can see the simulation easier. So I'm making several changes, but they're simple changes. Making several changes at once. I think that's still within the spirit of bricolage programming. What I'm not doing is kind of going back to the drawing board and making an elaborate plan about all these things that I want to do, and then only after I finish that elaborate plan, going and starting to develop the thing, right? The idea of bricolage programming is about starting with something that works and then tweaking and tinkering and getting it to do more interesting things. So we'll make it run. Well, my wind resistance is clearly very strong now. Our character is kind of running out of steam. Pretty quickly. Um, we're not really bouncing on the right wall, I realize, and that's because um, our X variable 
controls where the left image of the character is, but it's actually the right edge of the character that should bounce on the wall. So that suggests to me that we could change our rule here about the bouncing. Instead of it being when it's 800, since our character is 80 pixels wide, let's make it 720, 800 minus 80. And let's put even more initial X speed in just to make it fun. And let's make the wind resistance kind of halfway in between where we were before and where we are um, before that. And how does it work with these variables? Now we're bouncing around. And running out of steam. So, you know, not a not a an ter not an uninteresting simulation. Uh, and I think with lots of potential to develop it further, um, we've got our own photographic imagery being used, in, used and we've got a gravity-inspired model of how things bounce in the world being used. So both of those things are kind of interesting and could be taken in different directions by different people. Um, also, more generally, the idea of using variables to represent things and then rules to modify those variables separate from rules that draw from those variables could allow us to simulate other things that are not just about motion and bouncing and what have you. So there's lots of stuff to explore there. Um, I think there's one last change I want to make to this very this all too simple piece um, in order to, um, to make it a, a more interesting piece. And that's to give it some way of resetting, right? When we experience this piece as an audience member, right? One of the things we notice is that when we press play, it starts out with some dynamism and motion, and then that motion and dynamism kind of peters away as our simulated wind resistance takes effect. And then at that point, in fact, probably already, the piece starts to get boring because it's not doing much anymore. So what if we could make it start again? Well, let's use mouse clicked for that. We saw this in an early processing tutorial that we could make a function called mouse clicked and any instructions that we put in between the curly braces, those instructions happen when the mouse is clicked. And here is where our separation of the rules that change the variables from the rules that do drawing is gonna help us. Um, because now what we can we know what we have to do to make the 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 game or the model reset itself, all we have to do is reset those variables. So what if I put x to a random position between 0 and 800, or between 0 and 720? What if I put y to a random position between, um, between I don't know, 0 and 300? So it starts a little bit high in the air. And what if I make x speed a random number between 0 and 10? And what if I make y speed also a random number between 0 and 10? Those are my four variables, right? Yep. So every time I click, I'm going to get a new set of initial conditions. So then what happens is that we watch the piece. Here's our initial run. And we'll let it go to the point where it becomes boring. Maybe some of you are saying this is already boring, but oh well. I'm not so easily bored, which I consider a strength. Okay, now it's getting kind of boring. It's just doing the same thing. And I'm gonna click, and we get a new start with different conditions. And every time I click, I can restart it in different random places. And it's a simple change, but from the standpoint of thinking of this as, um, you know, as a project, as a standpoint of thinking of this as a simple piece of generative art, this simple change uh, is actually really significant because it now the piece has become an interactive piece, and my interaction in the form of clicking with the piece gives me as the audience member some control over this experience and how um, long it, it is, it, how long the experience is. If I 
want to enjoy this experience and to think about what's going on this in, in this experience for longer, letting me interact with it um, by clicking it and restarting it actually encourages that longer, deeper, more reflective interaction with the piece. So um, I think this is going to be a thing that a lot of us are going to experience as we iteratively develop our projects, if we're doing generative art projects, is that they might start out as less interactive pieces if we're emphasizing generative rules and models, but there'll often be moments in the bricolage where we can insert interaction in order to, to create a more engaging experience for that generative art piece. So, you know, just a, a tip or a heads up, like if you're doing a generative piece, watch out for opportunities um, that arise um, to insert interaction um, into the piece. So that's it for today. And um, that's it for, um, for processing in these lectures. Um, at the beginning of next week's lecture, I am going to briefly show some web programming technologies. I don't know that there are going to be too many projects in that zone, uh, unless, maybe only if people already have some prior experience. But um, apart from programming the web, thinking about the web, thinking about the history of the internet, that is really what we're moving into doing uh, in the very final, the postlude part of the course. Um, and we're going we're gonna to take that discussion of the history and technology of the internet and the web together with our previous discussions in the course. That's going to form the bedrock of that essay that we're, gonna for, we're, we're all going to write for the, the final um, take-home exam. So thanks for listening, folks. Get in touch if I can help, and have a good week and weekend.